Thank you so much for joining, taking the time today to have this important conversa uh, conversation. So the question we're really asking is, what can we do to promote equality? Um, obviously at Innovate UCLA, we have a commitment to justice, equity, and inclusion. So what we're gonna do today is share some stories and perspectives and voices that can kind of elevate how individuals experience systemic injustice and also uh, what people across the tech industry are doing to promote positive social change. So first off, I'll just go over a couple housekeeping things. I see most of you are on mute. Um, just make sure you're on mute so we don't hear kids and dogs and things. Um, and then, so if you have, kind of the format of this will be, Ron's gonna kick us off. Um, he's gonna go over some, ex the three A's we'll call them and I'll let him tell you all about it. But Ron Guerrier is um, the CIO and secretary of innovation at technology at, for the state of Illinois. He also was a former chair of the executive board here at Innovate UCLA. So we're super excited to have him back and uh, shedding some awesome knowledge and, ex and uh, experiences for us. And then um, if you have questions, you can either type them in the chat or when he's done, uh, we'll open it up for some Q&A. Um, then after the Q&A, we'll go to our next speaker. Um, same, if you have questions, you can either enter them in the chat as they come or you can ask after that speaker is done. And then at the end, we're gonna open it to an open platform for conversations, questions, story, anything you think is relevant that should be shared um, so we can have these conversations and, and help create this social change. So I'm gonna kick it off to you, Ron, welcome. I'll go on mute and we're excited to hear you. Thank you, thank you, Piper. And hopefully everyone could hear me fine. Piper, you can hear me okay? Uh, I'm in my dungeon here in Chicago. Um, and so first and foremost, I intentionally was late just to get you guys excited, that, that's not true. Um, I had some technical <laughs> issues and I had to boot my son off. I didn't realize he just started a game and it somehow, anyway, I'm here. Thank you again, Piper. Rafi, I know you're freaking out in the background. Um, thank you for being patient with me. As a CIO, I should know better, but um, I forgot about the one variable, an 18 year old. So with that being said, um, thank you very much for your time. Thank you for inviting me to this session. Um, this is a very poignant conversation. It's something that honestly is long overdue. Uh, my goal today is not to give you a history lesson. That's not my, my attempt. That's not what I'm to do. Um, what I'm also um, going to provide is a perspective. Please understand it's the perspective of me, Ron Guerrier, um, but I can't speak for all black folks. I have no intention to because you'll learn if you haven't already, the diversity within the African American community, the black community is broad, absolutely broad. Um, but there is something that definitely ties us together and that is um, a beautiful skin tone and unfortunately years of just it and sometimes being a, an adverse thing but I can tell you from the jump I am ridiculously proud to be who I am for a variety of reasons and uh, I'll quickly get through that so what I tried to do ah, it worked okay so um, as, as being in my dungeon I, I didn't want to give Rafi a presentation because I wanted to follow the flow um, what you see be behind me, and hopefully you can see it because I made sure the room's dark enough. There's an image on this side. This is me when I was roughly six years old, in my beautiful brown suit. On the other side, this is probably a couple years ago, I was giving a speech in London. Um, and I often think back, what would I be saying to myself and all those experiences I've had? Um, and they've been a lot. And like with everyone, um, they've been challenging. And everyone has challenges. So a lot of things I'll say is not unique to me. Um, we all have a way that we've navigated where we're at, but I'm gonna give you some tidbits of kind of how I got where I'm at um, to give you some perspective. Um, and, and really what it's like to be um, a black person in America. Um, proud American, and you'll hear about all that in a second. So again, uh, it's past and present. Right hand side, that's me in college, University of Illinois, got my dreads. Um, realized I needed to cut those back in 96 to get a real job. Um, and then on the other side, that is me as a guest speaker at Dreamforce. I did it twice. And if you know Dreamforce, 120,000 folks live, a lot of people on video. 
And essentially, it's a little nerve wracking because you're up there with uh, Mr. Benioff, but at the end of the day, um, you're telling the story about what your company has done, leveraging their products. And for me, it was one of those moments like, wait a second, um, I think I'm doing something right. So I'm pretty hard grader on myself. And so I always look back at that and say, okay, I'm, I'm somewhat doing something right along the way. So um, again, part of the history that I need to share to give you context to kind of the stories I'll share is on the, this side of me, um, this is my mom, um, when she migrated from Haiti back in 1968. Haiti essentially is the original Wakanda. Um, black nation, um, broke from French rule in 1804. So there's a sense of pride in Haiti that it was the first um, black nation um, and it revolted against Napoleon. Um, unfortunately, it has paid a severe price ever since uh, when it comes to instability, and other things. And many people do not know Haiti had to pay reparations back to France for over 80 years, um, which is one of the reasons why part of the GDP never recovered. Um, one of many reasons. I'm the proud descendant of Philippe Guerrier. Um, he was president for nine months, which in Haitian presidencies is pretty long. Um, but nonetheless, I'm proud of my last name translates to warrior, if you know French. Somehow I got that moniker and I, I actually hold pride to it. But well, my mom has always had my back. And she's always said things along the way that as a kid, you just don't know what she's talking about. Like every time I go on a trip somewhere, I always go on a night hike. I always want to see the city I'm in, the host city. And my mom used to always freak out, whether I was young, even to this day, if I tell them I'm traveling somewhere, she just completely freaks out. And I never really understood why until I became a parent. And so she and I have the conversations and Fear she has is not for me getting into riffraff, not for me getting in trouble. It's for people who run across me, they fear me, there's a concern, I might be up to something, and then it will explode into something that is um, unfortunate for me. And so before I became a parent, I never understood it, like I was just a mom being mom. Then I realized that there's this added concern as a black mother that she has for a black son. Um, again, it took me a while to figure that out until I um, got to that point having um, kids of my own. But I'm going to give you three, three quick stories. And again, I also consider myself um, very lucky. Um, I won't say privileged, right? I grew up um, in a lower, um, lower class family, but dad worked three jobs, mom worked a couple, um, they put us through Catholic school. So I actually had opportunities that I know other people didn't, like my cousins who grew up um, in, in the south side of Chicago. But the first one that you see behind me is an image of keys. Now keys always denote access. Like if you have keys, you get access to something. And so at University of Illinois, phenomenal alma mater, um, I was a custodial engineer. Um, on my resume, that's what it says, custodial engineer. It's a janitor, but it's a custodial engineer. And on several occasions, um, I did that for two years and it paid phenomenally well. Back then, minimum wage was four bucks. I was getting 750, so it was pretty good and I was paying my way. And despite doing it for two years and despite having this ring on my hip, um, at least two dozen times, I was either detained or arrested because they perceived me breaking into university buildings. Um, now, this is not the first time I've come across just flat out nonsense, but those are the first time I really, I started realizing that perhaps even in a great institution like Illinois, um, you just get that. And many times my foreman would have to come and verify it was me because my badge picture was not acceptable. The 2000 keys on my hip were not acceptable. The fact that they just pulled me over the three weeks earlier was not acceptable. And after a while, that starts wearing on you. It starts wearing on your psyche. Um, but nonetheless, I got out of that school. It's a great school, but I got it in four years. Um, but it's just one of those moments of many in my life where I realized that um, regardless of how hard I try, no matter how hard I fit in, um, I will always be kind of identified in a different way. And I am absolutely proud to be African-American, Haitian-American. But this is one of those first moments I have all the access needed, but I don't have the access. And it started hurting, it started eroding, but I'm like, okay, I'm gonna do this. I'm not gonna just let it get over me in the slide. So the second one 
is an image of you can see is coffee. So coffee seems pretty simple. It's a cup of coffee. And so here's one where this has happened at least a dozen times. I could count off of, offhand. So there's a lot of tech conferences we've gone to. I've met many of you at tech conferences. Many of you are actually real dear friends of mine and we've had great conversations at tech conferences. Um, so this particular tech conference was in Orange County and I won't go more specific than that. And so I'm over at this tech conference and I always had a struggle in when it comes to networking. I walk into a room and there's usually two or three people of color and then probably a couple hundred um, non-people of color. And so I always struggled, who do I attach to? And before I got to know Jim personally as a great friend, I would just walk in and just try to kind of sidle up to a group, right? Because you just try that networking thing. And this particular case with coffee um, was a little poignant. So I walk up, I'm having a conversation and I'm trying to just start talking, right? I'm, I'm in the mix, right? I'm a young black CIO, I'm just I'm getting into it. And I start being questioned, where's the coffee? And I'm like, well, I'm not quite sure. Where is the coffee? I'm thinking I'm having this great dialogue about coffee. And then the individual says a second time, well, do you know where the coffee's located? And I was like, no, I'm sorry. I'm, I don't know where the coffee is. I wish we could get some good coffee. Like, I'm still thinking I'm in this conversation. And then he says, oh, well, if you would hurry up and fetch us the coffee, then we could probably, you know, get on to the next event or something like that. And I said, excuse me? So yeah, just fetch the coffee. Like, let's just get this going. I need my coffee. And at that point, I realized that he thought I was hotel staff. He thought I was a waiter. He assumed that I must have been not there for the conference. Mind you, at those conferences, you have to wear your lanyards. You have to identify yourself. And so I remember this moment. I said, excuse me. I just put my finger up. And I act like I had a phone call, that fake call that we sometimes get when we don't have a conversation. I wandered off. And I looked at my phone. I just act like I was talking. I was off in the corner minding my business, trying to figure out how do I kind of get out of this, because that was a ridiculously embarrassing moment. And about maybe three to five minutes later, five minutes or so, and I'm still trying to figure out, okay, who do I sidle over next, because clearly that didn't work. Uh, hotel security comes. They decided to check my credentials. And they asked my credentials, they asked me for my driver's license, they asked me why am I here, and I answered all questions, but I could honestly tell everyone in this audience, I was seething inside because it really, really hurt that I had to go through this level of scrutiny um, in California um, at a tech conference. Um, and so after he did all his work, he kind of said, okay, you're clear. No apology, you're clear. Um, he looks over at the table that I left. He gives the guy a head nod, and the guy gives him a head nod back, like he's clear, he's good. It bothered me. It absolutely bothered me, but it bothered me for a variety of reasons. One, clearly the obvious. Why am I being singled out? But the other one was I am actually the keynote speaker the next morning. I am actually the person that some of these people came to meet. I had a story to tell about an innovation lab that we got an award for. Um, but nonetheless, um, I left, went outside, and it happened again. Someone asked me to get their car because they assume I was valet. Um, what I learned from that day, other than never wear a red tie to a conference because they assume you're valet, is you really just got to swallow your pride sometimes because the next morning I gave probably one of the best um, keynote speeches I could ever give. And I saw the individual in the front row and I they made no comments. Um, of course, later he approached me as if he did not know me and wanted to exchange information. So those are subtle moments where it's kind of, it happens. But the last one I'll share when it comes to the three, it's a water bottle. Hopefully you can see that behind me. It's a water bottle. It's just a water bottle, right? Hydration, right? Well, I'm leaving an office and I'm leaving the office. It's nine at night, working late um, because the next day I'm going to another part of the States to talk about STEM education. And where I'm going is a predominantly um, rural area, a little bit um, impoverished, but they really believe in STEM and STEAM education. So I leave the front door of the office, I say goodbye to the janitor, because I get to know him real well, his name was Jeff. And I'm walking down the street, and as a person of color, you start noticing patterns. And I noticed this pattern of this truck that was lifted, taking a couple of laps around the building. No mind, that's okay, whatever. And then they actually timed it, so when I got to the stop sign, 
he pulled up right next to me. And there was three people in the front seat. It was an F-150. It was raised. I know cars. And uh, rolled down the window, um, threw a water bottle at me, uh, said, nigga, go home, and then tried to run me down off the sidewalk. And I would say for the next three blocks to my hotel room, I kept on walking back across the street to make sure I could see which direction he was coming from. And he did two or three other laps, yelling stuff. Um, I got back to my hotel room. I put a chair in front of the door and I sat there and I was just like, well, nothing's changed. And the sad part of that story is I am the secretary of innovation for the state of Illinois. I report directly to Governor Pritzker. I'm proud of that. And I am responsible for technology for the state. I worked for those people who threw things at me. My job was to better their lives. And they just diminished me and decided to take that opportunity um, um, just to be jerks. And so we live in a land right now where you think, well, this doesn't happen anymore or uh, not in this day and age. This was February. This was this year. A month later, I went to Dubai and my job was to promote STEM education between Chicago and the uh, Emirate of Dubai. That was my task on that trip. But a week earlier in my home state, um, they dropped the N-word and they make me feel like I'm a hunted animal. So I bring these things up because my goal when I share these stories, and again, every single black person probably has one or two, um, or if not more, and I have more, but I'm gonna leave it at that for the most part, is that our goal in this moment after George Floyd's death is that I'm sensing a change. I'm sensing people want to listen and they want to hear, right? But I'm also making sure that I'm doing it in a way that I'm not making anyone feel guilty for the actions of those in their race. That's not my goal. My goal is to just build awareness. So you're aware that despite the calm, cool demeanor and the sarcasm, and my mom, sorry, my sister, is a doctor of psychology, and she says my sarcasm is my relief. So if everyone knows me, and Jim's known me for a while, I'm a sarcastic guy, but part of that is that's how I relate. That's how I just make light of things. Because if I let it eat away at me, my mental state will completely just go um, out the window. So the water bottle. So as everyone else that's a parent, um, I am proud of, of being a parent. Um, over my shoulder, it's Jasmine, she's now 20, gonna be 21 next month, goes to the University of Chicago, and she has decided to go into law because she feels that she could do better in law giving back to um, creating greater equity. So it's my baby girl and my son. And when I talk about my son, he is an amazing kid. Both kids graduated with four, six GPAs, ran track, competitive hip hop, I DJed for them. Um, but when I look at my son, I, I get nervous. I get emotional. I get scared. Um, when he started driving at 16, I started really worrying about where is he at, just like every parent. But it wasn't the fear of him doing anything silly, because he always made sure he had good friends around him. It's because I never know if he's going to run across uh, an officer who just had a bad day and has unconscious biases or conscious ones. Or there is a community uh, watchdog group while he's taking a jog in the neighborhood, like what happened in Atlanta, sorry, in Georgia. Um, those are the fears I have that are a little added beyond just being a regular dad. And so when my son comes home, we made a deal back in the day when he was like five, and he's 18 now, that anytime he comes home, anytime he sees me, his job is to give me a hug and kiss. And he does even at 18 years old, even in front of his friends, which I'm like, you sure you want to do that? He's fine with it. And so as a, as a father of a, of, a, of a child of color, um, the kid's six foot tall, maybe at best, 110 pounds, he can't hurt nobody. But again, a cop might misread something and just take it out on my son, just because of the color of his skin. And mind you, his mother is Filipino. He's light skinned, it doesn't matter. At the end of the day, he's at risk. And actually, I get emotional sometimes just thinking about the thoughts I have when I know he's out and about. But again, every parent worries. What I'm sharing here is this added risk, added concern that I have as a father of a child of color. So this quick picture is a picture of my mother and my daughter. And so they, they have some similarities, as you can see. 
my mom worried about me going to school, all the things a black mother has of a black child. I do not want my daughter to have to have the same concerns for her black child when she is eventually a mom, right? And I know I have to do the best I can to slowly, the best I can, break that cycle. I have to. Um, so sessions like this, the conversations we're having, will help me get to that goal. Because I don't want Jasmine to worry about what Anne-Marie worried about for years. But at the end of the day, I do worry. And here's a silly thing that I do when I talk to a potential boyfriend of Jasmine's. I give him give a scenario. If a cop starts telling you and starts yelling at you, how do you respond? If he responds, well, you know, forget the cop, blah, 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 and he has an attitude, I tell Jasmine, this is not who you want to hang with. Because I want him to be as respectful as possible because while the cop might be beating him up, unfortunately, a stray bullet could hit my daughter. And that's just a concern I have. And every parent has these concerns, mine are just heightened. And that's just an example of one. So Jasmine, through the years, going to use Chicago. A couple of fallacies I want to kind of quickly just talk to if possible. The first one is, I am a huge patriot. I'm an American. I'm a Haitian American. And there's this fallacy out there that if you question equality, if you question kneeling or anything, then you're not patriotic. Please, please understand that is such a fallacy. You can question things, right? Our nation was founded on questioning things. That's our right to do, but it doesn't make me any less patriotic. I am actually ridiculously patriotic. I can name every president. I can almost name every vice president. I know a lot about American history and I'm proud of it. We are a flawed nation as every nation, but we also have to own up to some of the mistakes we've made over the last 401 years. And so there's a fallacy that maybe black folks are not, we are, we're very patriotic. Please understand that. I think this audience does, but please disseminate that out. You can question and be patriotic, please. Because I was told on the 4th of July, well, are you gonna celebrate the 4th? Well, I celebrate the 4th, I question what independence really means. Nothing's wrong with that. But I am proud of the fact that I am here because it's a land of opportunity and my parents came here in 68 for that reason. And the other one's a Venn diagram and many people have seen these before. This, this is, you know, words are small, but it just says, I believe that George Floyd was murdered, yes. I believe police reform is needed, yes. I believe that looting is wrong, yes. I believe we have the right to protest, yes. In the middle is where I sit. I believe in all those things as many Americans do. So the divisiveness that's happening today, it doesn't have to be a binary choice. We can have these multiple points of view. Here's another one I just want to quickly throw up there. Black Lives Matter. Let me quickly talk about this one. This is one just completely befuddles me because the more I explain it, people get it, I think really do. So this image is a really simple one. This one just shows a series of black fists and um, Black Lives Matter, some believe Black Lives, the fist is a little higher, the one on top. That's not what Black Lives Matter is about. Black Lives Matter is the one on the bottom. All fists are at the same heights. Black Lives Matter just as much as everyone else's lives. But the way I also explain it is how I did on a, on a call recently, where you have a neighborhood and every house in the neighborhood matters. We agree. Every life in that house matters. Absolutely. However, we notice that there is this chronic ongoing issue with this one house in the neighborhood. All houses matter, we all agree with that, but that one house needs a little extra attention. Can we please rally as a neighborhood, as a community, and let's focus on improving what's going on in that life? Can we do that? Because if we don't, think about it. Eventually brown lives, yellow lives, whatever color you wanna kind of equate to, that will be affected. So let's focus on that one house. The other analogy I hear a lot of, and I think it resonates, is when Boston bombing happened and people say Boston strong, people didn't quickly say, well, Chicago strong, LA strong. No, that's not the time for that. We're talking about an issue in front of us right now. So hopefully that helps people understand that I truly believe all lives matter. And one of the reasons is this is my crew. This is my clique, if you can see them behind me. This is the team that I've been working with at Toyota, Farmers, in there, there's Sri Lankans, there's a Jordanian, two African Americans, a Puerto Rican, a Filipino. This is one of my cliques. I have many cliques, as we all do. And 
all their lives matter to me just as much as my own and my son's. So I want people to really understand that we are in the black community, a very diverse group of people. I'm Haitian American, but I listen to different things. I do different things as well. And I'm proud that at one point that two of my friends asked me to marry them. I was a justice of the peace for a Sri Lankan and an American. And this was last year and I'm still proud of it. They asked me to say the words and get ordained. You can do it online, by the way, it's only 10 bucks. So it's amazing. But again, all lives matter. I really want people to understand that when I say that, I also want to focus on the black lives. The black lives do matter and here's why we're saying it. It's not to diminish anyone else. It's not a checkbook. We're not trying to do debits and credits. We want to raise all boats. So please understand that. So a couple of final things, um, focus more on history. So this image has myself with Reverend Jesse Jackson. Um, and for years, I've been working with him on different initiatives to make sure that we actually just have a voice. Like Hamilton, we want to see at the table. Um, we're not trying to take over anything. We want to be included. Um, the inclusion is what we're really talking about. And on the right-hand side, when I was at Farmers Insurance Group as a CIO, I co-founded the Black Professional Alliance. It was a group of um, African Americans, people of color, and farmers who wanted to have their own ERG, Employee Resource Group. So we got together and we took our first picture. And the first picture was beautiful. It was like 20 black people, me in the center, and we're all just smiling. And we all looked at the picture and like something's wrong with this. This is supposed to be an all-inclusive group. And only people who signed up for it are black folks. So we rebooted the group. And we told everyone we want inclusion because we can't do it on our own. We need allies. We need people to understand the black experience. We want to be part of marketing campaigns so we don't put out an ad that doesn't make any sense or could be actually misunderstood. And so we did that. And we, six months later, rebooted. We had well over 200 folks in the picture. We actually had to use a drone to take the picture. And it was the most diverse group of people um, you could ever find. And so that was at Farmers. And we invited the Tuskegee Airmen to speak. Farmers um, later um, had Martin Luther King Day off. And they're actually part of the parade now. So those are the things that we really need our advocates and our allies for. Um, so when we do the ERGs, I want to make sure it's all as inclusive as possible. Another thing I would hopefully share with this group is um, these five individuals. Um, you have Martin Luther King. And these are ones that you read in your textbook, of course, as growing up. And some of them you haven't heard of, but these you have. Martin Luther King, peace. Um, Barack Obama, uh, Obama, respectful power in my opinion. And this is, again, in my opinion. Um, Malcolm X. Malcolm X, I think, got a bum rap historically. Clearly, he began with a really divisive tone. I agree with that, and everyone did, because he was frustrated. He took a trip, if you did your history, and he started realizing that there's a lot more diversity in the world. And he changed his tone. And he started really understanding that we need to work together. He started talking about having allies. And due to that change in tone, he unfortunately got assassinated. But again, history wasn't really kind to him sometimes. And the reason I'm bringing this stuff up is um, black folks, brown folks, whatever you are, please understand history and include all the parts of history to understand why things are the way they are the best you can. And the image, um, that's James Baldwin. Not many people know who James Baldwin is um, in the black community. I believe a lot of people do. James Baldwin was an amazing writer. Um, he came up in the 50s, 60s, 70s. I believe he passed in the, um, the mid 80s, mid to late 80s. And actually every other civil rights leader read his work. He was the muse behind all a lot of things they were thinking. Um, he was a black man. He was a black gay man growing up in the 50s, 60s, and 70s. Can you imagine the challenges he had? And he decided to leave for France and came back because he felt he could do more. And his writing went a little bit more um, militant because he felt that he was frustrated. But I only bring this up because a lot of people ask me, who do you read? How do you understand your history? James Baldwin is one of the individuals that I actually refer to because I believe his words are poignant. Um, and the last one I want to quickly share is what, are we, what can we do about it in the tech community? I know that was one of the focuses and I know we started seven minutes late. I think we're at 4.37, we should be okay. Blacks and Technology over on this shoulder is a conference, it's called BitCon. And first two years it was done in Minnesota. And Amy Klobuchar spoke, I was a speaker. Nipsey Hussle was a speaker, unfortunately it was before his passing. And the focus of it was how do we get more diversity in technology? And again, this is one of the reasons why we're talking today. 
what can we do? And a lot of it is the networking. A lot of it is getting people to really understand um, that the world is changing, so our technology needs to change and our workplace needs to change. I've gone to conferences where Michelle Obama has spoken at Salesforce. Um, they understand the power of technology and how it hopefully, if done right, improves the condition. Um, any kid can learn data analytics, any kid can learn cyber. And it's our job as parents and as leaders to tell all our children they can do whatever their mind comes up to them. There's a fallacy in the African-American community that we don't do math. <laughs> That's false. We do math, we do a lot of things, but we also do math. So having advocates to kind of encourage our kids to do that. Lower Left is a hackathon that we have here in Chicago. It's called Center Nifty. It's an organization we partner with. And what we do there is kind of do hackathons for young women in tech in the Chicago public schools. Really exciting stuff. And right there in Southern California, many of you guys probably have worked with STEM, STEM Advantage, uh, stemadvantage.org. I guess I am I'm promoting. It's an amazing organization focused on underserved communities and women in tech. Um, and over the years, we have provided mentorships, um, sponsorships, jobs, opportunities. Did it at Toyota, did it at Farmers. I believe James has done it at, at, at JPL. So if you have an opportunity, we have to create doors and let them knock those doors down through things like STEM Advantage. It's a great nonprofit. And this one is one of a picture that I took roughly six months until starting my job here at the state of Illinois. And what it is, is if you look at it, one side of the room, you have a lot of um, four young white um, men. Um, they're wearing suits, nicely dapperly dressed. And then the other side are four dapperly dressed uh, and cool kids as well, people of color. And so we had a hackathon and we had a, a problem statement. The problem statement was, we lost three state troopers in the state of Illinois due to people not pulling over or not kind of yielding for them on the side of the road helping another motorist. Uh, three deaths, unfortunately, in, in a six month period. So the challenge to the students were, could you think of a solution, a technology solution to inform motorists that they need to pull over? There's something called Scott's Law and they're breaking law by not doing it. These two teams, one from the suburbs of Chicago and one from the inner city of Chicago, merged their ideas together. They decided to meet downtown in the loop and it came with a phenomenal idea and they became like best of friends. And so our, I think our opportunity as mentors, as leaders is to just get the kids together, get them talking and get out of the way. And it's amazing how they could do some amazing work. Uh, and this is just this picture for me, all just gets me excited because they did it on their own. No one told them to meet. They decided that this is something that they could work on together. Here in Illinois, there's something called the digital divide. We have areas in Illinois that do not have broadband, rural and urban. So we're focused on, we got a $420 million bond that we're actually improving broadband. And Governor Pritzker recently, amongst others, donated $50 million to get every Chicago public school student um, free broadband for the next four years. So we have to make sure that we're doing our part. And me personally, I have something called Secretary G's Tech Talk Tuesdays at 2 p.m. Um, so the idea here is to have a discussion with teachers and students about what's going on in tech, how can we create equality in tech, and what I'm learning, and I learned this when I was in St. Louis, um, partnering with parents in Ferguson, is that we have to get the parents involved. We have to get them to understand the power of technology. A lot of parents assume that when you talk about technology, you're just talking about, oh, puppy. You're just talking about um, uh, fixing computers. You're just talking about a server, right? No, technology is so many different things. It's data analytics, it's cyber, it's everything. It's AI, it's having your watch talk to your car, talk to your other phone, right? So having the conversation with the parents is one of the things that Secretary G's Tech Talk Tuesdays does to talk to them about the job opportunities and when I explain that some jobs right out of college are in excess of $100,000 potentially, or starting salaries of 70 or 80, the parents' eyes light up. Like, seriously, he could do that? Just learning game design? Yes, he could. So I think one of our responsibilities is to make sure that we explain to the community at large what technology could do. Um, and so the last one is just a quick quote. It's off of my LinkedIn. But again, in short, um, I do feel like something is different. 
um, and to my people of color friends, to my non-people of color friends, NASCAR made a, de made a decision. Roger Goodell said it's okay to kneel. Mississippi is changing a flag. There's a discussion about Confederate um, forts and such. Those are conversations that we've never had before. And I remember back in 92, I believe it was 92, um, Roger King, I'm sorry, Rodney King. I remember those days and I thought something was gonna change after that and nothing did. And that was when I was actually at the end of my high school career, that was 25 years ago. But this feels different. But our goal, I think, is getting the community, getting allies, getting people to understand because we cannot do it ourselves and start with awareness. So with that being said, awareness is the first statement and you saw that embedded in my statements. Um, advocacy is another, it's very important. And the final one is action. We have to make sure we have those three things to move us forward. And I'm pretty excited where we're going. So at this point, I'm gonna pass the baton back to Piper. Um, I believe it's Piper and um, we'll go from there. But thank you for the time. Hopefully this gave you some perspective. Thank you so much, Ron. Uh, so at this time, what we're gonna do, if anyone has any comments, questions uh, that directly relate to the stories Ron shared or um, the current state, please feel free, uh, go ahead and you can just unmute yourself and ask them now. And then uh, we'll proceed to the next speaker after that. Hey Ron, this is Don. I, you know, I, I don't have a question exactly, but I just a comment. I, um, I just want to say how lucky we are to have you in our community, and how uh, how um, you know how, what a special individual you are to uh, to just very comfortably re relate you know some of these uh, incredibly um, rough experiences that you have and these incredibly proud experiences that you've had. Um, and for us to be able to have you here today uh, to, to help facilitate this discussion, um, I personally feel extremely lucky that, um, uh, th that you're a part of, of, of what we're doing here, and, and I thank you very much for, for participating. No, I appreciate that, Don. You've always been a great advocate, so I thank you for the time. Agreed. And thank you. And I'm also very excited to hear what Eric is going to share because the stuff that's happening up in <laughs> Oakland, well, up for you guys, west for me, um, is pretty amazing stuff. And you know, if that goes well, and I have every confidence it will, um, as long as I'm in this role serving Governor Pritzker in the state, I see an opportunity to kind of spread this. Well, I'm pretty excited about Eric's story and what they're doing, leveraging technology to improve the condition. Wonderful. So if there's no more questions at this point, I'm going to go ahead and introduce the next speaker. Final, final uh, opportunity here. <laughs> all right, so the next speaker we have, thanks again, Ron, I really appreciate it, we all do. Um, it was very touching and thank you for getting vulnerable and sharing. So the next speaker we have is Eric Lohila, and he's a director at Slalom who's been uh, working, teaming with local law enforcement in Oakland to um, using police analytics to enhance public safety. And um, I am going to let him dive into the details of that for all of us. Thanks, Piper. Eric, you Thanks, there? Ron. Yeah, there you can go. you hear me okay? Yep. Great. Thanks everyone uh, for your time today. I'm looking forward to sharing a little bit about our solution. Ron, I just wanted to echo what uh, a lot of folks said here. Thank you uh, for meeting us in a place of vulnerability and, and really sharing your story. Uh, that resonated with me and I learned along with everyone, I think, so thank you. Thanks, Eric, appreciate it. Yep. So I'd like to share a story with everyone today uh, about what we've been working on at Slalom with the Oakland Police Department. Uh, and to give you a little bit of a background about Slalom, if you haven't heard about us, uh, Slalom as a consulting group, uh, we're a modern firm focused on strategy, technology, and business transformation. We have 8,000 consultants, including 1,000 engineers, and we've built over 2,500 digital products. Uh, we're a digital native company that specifically focuses on building the future. Uh, and we were asked to come in and help the city of Oakland uh, on a journey they've been on uh, to transform their police department. Uh, they chose us specifically because of our deep technology expertise and our business acumen. Uh, we've partnered with 200 of the world's leading technology companies uh, to build what's next. And in this case, we leveraged uh, our relationship with Microsoft and built inside the Microsoft stack. 
What I want to uh, highlight to everyone here today uh, is Slalom's stance also specifically around uh, anti-racism and our desire to be a part of the solution. This is a quote from our CEO, Brad, uh, early in June. While our focus is inside Slalom to role model our stance against racism, we are also committed to engaging with local civic leaders and our clients and partners to apply our capabilities and technology to help tackle racism and systemic discrimination. This is from the top down and it's from the bottom up inside our company. And the solution I'm gonna share with you today is I think a big step uh, for our company to be one small part of the solutions we need to implement going forward. So that's the context for everyone here as we kind of dive into this. And first thing I wanted to uh, kind of tee up is, is a story I think has an allegory uh, to it. There we go. I hope some of you got a chance to uh, experience this live, this internet phenomenon around the viral photo of the dress and what color is it? Uh, hopefully some of you uh, experienced this and if you didn't, the context is this photo went out on the internet. Uh oh, can we back up here Rafi? We've got a little bit of lag on my screen. Thank you. Oh, <laughs> let's go the other way if we can. <laughs> I'm not clicking. Help. Thanks so much. One more. There we go. All right. So the context here is uh, folks either saw white and gold or blue and black. And there was a pretty significant debate about this dress. Now, for me, myself, I actually saw the dress as white and gold. And I believed it my whole self. And I defended it. In fact, I called my family to convince them. I was like, this is definitely a white and gold dress. Some of my family members told me I was crazy and they said, the dress is definitely black and blue. You're the one that's crazy. Point here is I got curious about the reason why we could see different colors. And it was actually grounded in neuroscience. It's a phenomenon called chromatic bias of the daylight axis. And basically what it means is our brains interpret images through subtraction. And what our brain interprets depends on what our eyes are focusing on. If we're focusing directly on the background, will actually interpret the dress as gold and white. And if we focus on uh, uh, different parts of the image, the dress itself will appear blue and black. Hopefully that slide will advance one here. There we go. So what color was the dress? The dress was confirmed royal blue. And what does the data say? The data says it's black and blue. So the interesting thing here is whenever I look at it and a period of time passes, I see the dress still as white and gold. But because I know that it's blue and black, I'm forced to adjust my perspective and see the dress in those colors. I can do this because I have the data and I'm able to understand that truth, but it takes intentional effort and the data. So to tie this together, today I'm gonna to share a story about how data and transparency of that data is helping the Oakland Police Department assess its policing practices and how they can improve going forward. So the backstory with Oakland, let me give you a little bit of context here. Looks like we've got about a 10 second delay on the slides here. Rafi, okay. yeah, yeah. Yeah. thanks so much. There we go. Perfect. Let's go ahead and go one more slide forward. Thank you. So let's set some context here. So for everyone, uh, Oakland is a city right next to San Francisco up here in the lovely Bay Area. I get a chance to live in this amazing place. Uh, but back in 2000, uh, there was a significant challenge presented to the community, the rider scandal. You can look this up. It's well documented. Uh, 117 uh, uh, citizens of Oakland uh, were named in a civil rights lawsuit accusing the city of bias in their policing. Uh, and that effort uh, caused the city of Oakland to have a deep period of reflection uh, that stemmed from federal oversight. And uh, a number of big city police chiefs were assigned to an independent monitoring team, a commission that has been working with Oakland since 2003 to help transform their police department. And we're gonna talk a little bit about this story and how this gets us to the present. In 2015, California passed a comprehensive law, very important law, 
uh, that requires every single policing agency in the state to collect stop data. That's the time, the date, and the location of the stop. It's the reason for the stop. And then most importantly, it includes the outcomes, whether action was taken, whether there was a citation, arrest. It also includes the requirement to note perceived race, ethnicity, and gender, and a, the approximate age, and then what the officer did with it. Every single policing agency in the state has to collect this information and submit it to the attorney general. This is a part of Oakland's transformation as well because they started collecting this information across their systems. So how does that transformation actually uh, match up uh, for the city's journey? Let's see if we can get it to advance here again. Let's go one more. There we go. So as the city began this journey under federal oversight, they went through 10 police chiefs. They replaced 500 officers. This is a foundational transformation for the city. And this really, you can see it in four phases. There was an assess phase, there was a, rede a redefine phase, a rebuilding phase, and then finally a reporting phase. And through this journey of 17 years, the city has had to uh, come to terms with a number of the challenges that any organization that's seeking to transform does. It's, it's how do we go about our ways of working from a place of equity? And change is hard. And a number of those steps to reform involve working with Stanford and their research teams. They actually specifically leaned in to provide training for officers on identifying unconscious bias. They worked with commanders and leaders to understand how to train their officers, how subtle language cues and actions would be perceived by diverse communities. While I'm gonna speak about the technical nature of the solution and how technology is a part of the overall transformation, I wanna spend a minute to highlight the reason Oakland's police department has been able to change how they work is because they asked fundamentally hard questions and they leaned into the human element of policing that we're not going to get away from. Cops are going to be in our communities and they're interacting with our residents and teaching them to understand their unconscious biases and how to communicate effectively with the community is that the root of transformation and how we think about equitable policing. So on this officer side, they've done an incredible amount of work, but now let's talk about the technical and the underlying technical systems that Oakland required to collect all of this information, the databases that they needed, needed to be rebuilt entirely. So they spent six years just building these source systems before they were able to actually come through with a new command system that they launched uh, just this year starting in 2014, they built out this new system, it's called Vision, and they realized towards the end of this effort, one of the key agreements that they had as a part of their negotiated settlement was the ability to have a, a comprehensive analytics platform enabled on top of all of their systems. In other words, our officers have been re-educated and trained in how to practice a more meaningful way of policing with the community. We have our source systems to collect all of their interactions, now, how do we provide that analytical capability? The same way we think about enterprise, it's the same way we think about business. What are the metrics, the KPIs, and the core business questions that we need to be able to answer quickly so that our officers can do right in the community? And if there are challenges, we can identify them early. Go ahead and go to the next slide. Thank you. And so what we had was this incredible challenge and this objective uh, that we had to meet with their teams, which is how do we synthesize and transform police officer data into visualizations that enable rapid analysis? How can we actually help commanders of the city of Oakland identify hotspots? That ultimately will provide transparency and a more equitable experience. But getting to that point took a lot of time. And what I can share with you all is when we stepped in uh, to help from the slalom standpoint, took 42 days for their analytics team to answer core business questions. The data came from multiple sources. Some of the sources didn't update at a reasonable pace. They really needed to work quite, it was a very complex challenge for a number of teams to answer the questions that they needed to be able to speak to weekly with their senior leadership team. We took a look at the current need we said, what are those requirements? And we realized that ability to drill down, to filter, to see trending, 
to understand baseline comparisons across the city, and then to actually set threshold limits would enable those senior leaders to ask the questions that they currently had and to answer future state questions that we knew were coming down the line. Now, the additional outcomes that were generated as a result of this work, we have democratized access to data. And I wanna highlight this because I think it's absolutely the future of policing. Instead of having five or six senior leaders have access to the analytics team and these researchers that would go and answer the business questions, based on someone's rank inside the police department, now over 100 commanders and supervisors are able to review the data and the dashboards that I'll be showing you in a minute so they can actually query their data live and they can ask complex questions. They can start to see meaningful trends and insight in their community. This also is an instance where we're able to step into a space of discrimination and bias and more users touching the data and viewing it means transparency and light in corners right now is something our society is asking for. It also means we're able to reduce that 42 day time of latency down to one. We can see yesterday's data today and that changes the way the police officers interact with that information. We have over 400 metrics available. Next slide, we're gonna go ahead and skip two more to the solution and I'd love to show you all what we've been working on. So let's talk about what we actually built. So when we took a look in the space around analytics for police officers and how we could look at behavior, we realized that there weren't a lot of sources for us to draw from. And so we went, and we realized that there was an opportunity for us uh, to really think about this from a Greenfields approach. And this is something that our design team and, and our solution architects, we relished the opportunity to sit down from the standpoint of discovery and ask the Oakland PD and say, we understand what you know you can do now, we're interested in what you would like to do. Help us paint a future vision around the questions you wish you could ask. And they came back to us and they said, how do we identify officer behavior that indicates the potential for racial bias? Can we identify a pattern in stops from an individual officer? How about if we could identify officer behavior that indicates an excessive force incident? These are important questions for the community and asking them previously required all of the different data from all these sources to be pulled together. And we were able to draw up and sketch out, could this answer some of these questions for you? We believe the data sources you have can enable this. And what you see in front of you here is our first version. And remarkably, after the five weeks of discovery in these pencil drawings, uh, what we built looks remarkably similar, and we'll get a chance to see that in just a second. Uh, so as we move forward, thank you. Uh, we've sketched out the solution overview, and here's an actual architecture document. I know we've got a number of tech folks in the room, and so you can see those source applications on the left. We built this in Azure Government Cloud, uh, and we were able to build out the analytics data warehouse, and then we were actually did, we did all of our viz in Power BI and pushed that out through the gateway to a SaaS solution. The commanders interact with this uh, via web browser on their secure laptops inside the police department. All right, next slide. Wonderful. So let's go ahead and load this up. So let's take a look. This is an actual screenshot of the dashboard that's gonna be going into production. This is using dummy data. So any of the numbers you see here are just for uh, testing purposes, but I wanna highlight. So you're a senior commander inside a police department that has the challenging uh, uh, ask every week to say, are we meeting our community where they are? And are we looking for early indicators of hotspots where officers could be too aggressive or not act uh, appropriately using force in the community? This is your summary dashboard. You turn on your computer in the morning and the first thing you see is a senior leader. Uh, and below that, you can actually see areas and then all the way down to squad. So this gives us an ability to look at our whole city of 1100 officers and four and a half, uh, 450,000 residents. And then we have metrics. And I wanna spend a minute highlighting what you can actually see here. We can actually see the who, the bureau, the officer, the when, and the what. And what that means for us is a senior leader can look at this dashboard and they can actually say either yesterday or all the way up to five years historically, show me what officers, what areas in my city were involved in investigations, intel led stops, whether there was a discretionary stop committed, was there a use of force associated with it? What was the outcome of that stop? And was there anything recovered? 
What we found from the Federal Monitoring Commission and working with senior leaders as well as Stanford is these are key determinants in understanding if a police department is practicing unconscious, conscious bias or discrimination by their police department. And these kinds of questions and the ability for senior leaders to ask them quickly can identify trends before they become serious problems and they can hold accountable officers inside the organization that are outside guidelines. This is foundationally different than the way most police departments currently practice policing. And we've heard from the most senior leaders, this is no less than an absolute transformation in how they work with their officers and how they serve the community. In the past, these kinds of questions couldn't be answered on a daily basis. And at best, they were done in quarterly reviews. Every single day, senior leaders can turn on this dashboard and you can see on one slide, one page, what are the stops? What are the searches? What are the rates of recovery in the city? How are arrests? And most importantly, was there force used? These are questions America's asking uh, in a really deep, uh, moral and normative way that the city can look at and actually provide answers to, to their elected leaders and to residents that are asking for more uh, transparency. So I wanna to speak to you what's next. Uh, we continue to work with the city of Oakland. Uh, we've just completed our first release. We're gonna be releasing uh, uh, our second tier of options or availability in terms of features to them in the next month. And hey, we're Eric. hearing from commanders, mm -hmm. Piper. Sorry, really quickly before you go on to the yeah. next, uh, there was a good question about Thank what you. the hotspots are. No, that's okay. So maybe if you could um, identify sure. what you mean by the hotspots and how the data is collected. Um, and then uh, is it like up to the officer to report or just a little more detail on that before we go on to the next would be really great. Yeah, great question. So this is, I love that you're asking it. It's in a future slide to kind of speak to some of the things, but let me back up because I think that'll give us some more context. Um, what we've been able to do uh, with this solution is what you see down here in these black circles. These are the number of the source systems. And we have seven different source systems that we are able to pull information from. That includes the training data uh, from the academy as well. It involves complaints data that comes in from the public themselves. Uh, it involves pursuit information, as well as the officer's stop data. So one of the questions that has been asked by uh, many members of the community is, how can I trust the data? And you're absolutely right. Uh, they should be asking those questions. Uh, what we found is by marrying all of these source systems of data into the dashboards, we are able, able to uh, answer questions around whether veracity is in question, because a number of officers will have correlative data. And because we can compare across the system, we can see if there's in a sense a bad apple or someone it looks to be baking uh, their data in, or cooking their data in a different way. So that's how we've, we've chosen to look at that. That said, I think there is still a lot of work to be done, uh, especially using MLAI going forward, where we could actually look for uh, greater trends in the data, where we might see across a police force other anomalies that we haven't been able to catch yet. Um, this is so new in terms of what we're enabling right now i think this is really release one in, in many uh, forms and our hope is going forward uh, we can provide additional nuance and insight for the commanders one thing i want to highlight is we have not provided a predictive uh, capability in this uh, i think we're hearing as a country right now there's a, a greater need to uh, for scrutiny around technology solutions specifically as it relates uh, uh, to frankly, making decisions on behalf of the police department that often disadvantage or disenfranchise uh, Black and BIPOC communities. So I think we have really made the, uh, an early stage decision to not get into the predictive capability, but leveraging all of these source systems and presenting the information for senior leaders to make decisions around. I'll pause here since we're asking questions. Does anyone have any questions specifically related to the dashboards? There was one question, not about the uh, dashboards, but about, oh, actually about the there news? is one about the hotspots, absolutely. Um, so the question that was just posted was, what role do you see AI having in identifying quote unquote hotspots, trends or other patterns? On the flip side, what are the dangers of implicit bias built into certain AI engines like facial recognition? 
Those are two big questions. Uh, I'll, I'll take a, an initial uh, uh, go at them. Uh, first, around AI and, and predictive capabilities, what we're really looking is to use machine learning uh, to look for patterns that exist inside the data itself. And where we think the two biggest areas of focus should be initially are around data quality, maybe for historical data. It's not quite as sexy as telling us what the future state would look like, but actually understanding anomalies that occurred in, in data collection in the past can give us more insight because it allows for historical trend analysis, which I think is, is absolutely valuable for police departments. I think the other capability that we'll look to uh, is where we can incorporate aspects of body cam data. One of the areas that we'd like to focus on in the future is to incorporate more body cam data into these dashboards. That could involve using the metadata that's involved inside the body cam collection that we can actually tie it directly to the incidents so that it aids officers' ability to analyze it uh, more quickly and more effectively. Uh, we're working with a body cam company right now for early stage conversations to really think about what could that look like. What we're not trying to do though uh, is engage in any part of facial recognition technology we think there, that space is fraught with concern and we don't think that it's actually gonna produce better outcomes for communities. And right now we're focused on providing transparency through data. We think that is higher value than moving into a kind of a future state uh, where the systems are making decisions. That's not an area we're putting any product, a product focus right now. Piper, what was the first part right. of that question again? Did I get it all? Um, identifying, yeah. Uh, what role do you see AI having yet? Yeah identifying the hotspots. Yeah, right now uh, we have tr uh, trending data and what we can see is week over week or, or whatever the duration is set at, it gives uh, commanders an ability to understand where th uh, directionality. And so we have KPIs built in, but from an AI standpoint, we're still understanding uh, and seeking to understand more about how we could incorporate that effectively. But right now we're getting these dashboards uh, into the hands of the commanders and we're gonna be working with them from a research standpoint to really uh, ask those questions about what's, what's next. Awesome. Um, and the big question several people have asked, we do have several people from the city of LA, city of Burbank, so forth. Um, is this solution available for other cities? Thanks for asking. Uh, we are being cautious about uh, saying that anyone can do this, but the fact is everyone here is a technologist and has uh, probably worked with dashboards and, and BI analytics at a certain standpoint. If we can ask the right questions and we can get access to the data, then we can produce tools like this. This is an area of deep expertise for Slalom. Uh, we have a data analytics capability that's incredibly robust. And as a result, uh, we've reached out to a number of our clients across the country, uh, state agencies, and right now are in conversation with 11 major cities across the US. What I wanna highlight in this slide specifically is if you live in a state that's colored blue, any shade of blue, you currently have a law in place that requires agencies to collect stop data. The stop data that we mentioned earlier is the what, why, and how involved in a stop of a resident. Uh, this is foundational data for understanding where discrimination could be occurring in a community. It doesn't answer every question, and nor is it a panacea. And I don't mean to say that uh, these laws or these dashboards are gonna fix what is a fundamental problem in policing in our society. But this is a great place to start for a number of communities. And right now uh, we're looking to continue expanding what these dashboards can enable with other cities, as well as companies that are looking to step into the space. So right now we're deepening our partnerships with some providers uh, and we're really seeking to understand how we can be of service. Slalom's a local based company. So we're in uh, 31 American cities and we probably have someone with deep expertise in data analytics near you and we'd love to chat. I'll Great, when you say blue, second. do you mean the light blue or the dark blue? Yeah, both. If they're dark blue, uh, good job, okay. Illinois. Uh, they have a comprehensive stop data law, which means that they actually collect information related to both traffic as well as pedestrian stops. If it's light blue, that means they have a comprehensive law for traffic stops. And the majority of stops in, in many states are via, uh, vehicular. So a number of our American states do have stop data being collected right now. And the ability to sh uh, create transparency about this data and then build analytics on top of it is an absolute game changer. I was speaking with another police department today uh, on, in the South, and they're asking tough questions of their data and realizing that they need to build a more advanced analytics capability. And we're uh, optimistic this is an opportunity for everyone to learn more. Great. Uh, we have one more really good question. Um, so will this data be available to the public or just um, internally to the police force? 
Great question. Uh, one of the, the asks early on was, how do we keep, make sure that this data is secure and at the same time democratize its use? And so for this first release, all of the data uh, is available to the senior leadership inside the police department, but it's not been made publicly available. Our hope is in the future that uh, there can be a way that we can share more of this information out publicly. Uh, the city currently produces a, a report that goes out once a year that highlights a lot of the data that will be contained in our dashboards, but we don't currently have a public facing dashboard. So I think that's an opportunity for communities going forward to increase transparency by actually having that automated data available to the public, de-identified and appropriately scrubbed, but made available to help build trust. Wonderful. Mm -hmm. Any other questions from the audience here? I've covered quite a bit and uh, I just have a few closing thoughts, but I wanted to make sure we can answer any questions as we go. Okay, in closing thoughts, I just wanna acknowledge this is a complex uh, uh, time for our country. Uh, and I think for many of us, the conversation around how do we improve the police department is equally fraught with questions that are unanswerable right now. Uh, many police departments across the country uh, have histories of practicing uh, discrimination and bias. And I don't mean to say that slapping a dashboard on top of data is going to solve what has been an intractable challenge for our country for many years. But I do think there's a huge opportunity for us going forward to think about how we leverage data to create transparency and really inform both residents that live in the communities as well as senior leaders that do want to do well to make better decisions based on what is occurring in the street. And I hope that this is one solution that can help move us forward as a country. Thank you, everyone. Amazing, thank you, Eric, so much. Um, so now what we're gonna do, first off, I wanna thank everyone for who had questions, for their time, Ron, Eric, uh, sharing their stories. So now I'd like to open this up as more of a conversation, um, having the conversation, sharing what you're doing with, you know, personally or with your company or thoughts you have, um, and we'll kind of open it up, and if no one has anything, then uh, we'll, we'll give some food for thought. Hi, Brad, I have a question. Can you hear me? Absolutely. Yes. So this is to both Ron and Eric. Um, the, so when you talk about, when you use the word diversity, um, I, that's, a, that's a very broad term. And I wanted to, to get your thoughts on, you, I know Eric, from your perspective, you're, you're being very direct about systemic racism um, instead of using the word diversity, which could mean a, a number of things. Um, how has that, um, when, when you hear things like I'm colorblind or, um, you know, diversity, we love all people, you know, we're really looking at um, a broad form of diversity when it doesn't necessarily address the issue, have you come into, um, have you had to address that within ensuring that, you know, specific issues are being addressed versus, you know, it being very broad where you're basically trying to boil the ocean. So um, can you talk a little bit about, about that? That's to both you, Eric, to you and to Ron. Ron? CIO, I should know how to unmute. My apologies. So, um, so for me, that's a great point, Davida. Um, systemic racism. I think it's it's a it's a hard conversation because that's why my first A is awareness because I think a lot of people just assume at this day and time that that is a that's a historical thing that you know. Um, that people don't think that way, everyone's great people and you're colorblind so you don't see color, everyone's on the same page. And while that's a very nice thing to say, it's a nice sentiment, um, it's not necessarily accurate. My, my observations, my experiences. And so I think what we need to do is really talk about what you spoke of, is that there is a, a system in place um, that has been in place for many years. And I think it's become its own drained in some communities that you don't even realize it's there. Um, 
redlining is something that we we've heard of before and that's where certain people cannot buy homes in certain areas and they put it like a c next to their application to show a person of color so right off the bat they won't get the funding to get a house um i could so go down a rabbit hole on that one statement but i will not touch it um but the one thing i'll say though is um, when my parents moved to Evanston in 1975, um, they could not get a loan because the neighborhood that they wanted to move into um, was not diverse for the term. And so over years, there are still communities that still have, that is another example of um, systematic racism. It, it, it exists. So I think what we need to do is there's this altruist feeling that you know everyone's equal, it's not a big deal. Um, but it is a big deal and it does exist and we need to talk about it. I think Davida, what we really need to do is chat. And so I'll give you one quick example. And I said, I had others. So I live in Arlington Heights. It's a suburb of Chicago. We're about 15, 20 minutes north of O'Hare. I grew up in, in um, Evanston, a Northern suburb as well. And we chose here because it was closer to in-laws. It's not my control. I just pay the bills. I know how it works. And so, um, you know, we're here and three weeks ago, there was a path not too far from here around Lake Arlington. And someone thought it would be very smart to write Kappa 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 um, on the path, KKK. Um, and so myself and the firefighter that was across the street from me went down to, to the path and power washed it off and painted over it. This was right after Memorial Day when this happened. Um, and so I decided to jump on a Zoom call for the community because I've never jumped on the Zoom calls before. And I wanted to show that I am here, guys. Uh, hello, I'm here. I'm one of the few people of color here. And I introduced myself. I said what I do, the fact I serve them. Um, and I wanted to just have a dialogue about things like that. And why does someone think that is a good thing to do in 2020, to write KKK on a path that my son jogs on pretty much every other day? Um, but it's existing. And I think what we need to do is just have a dialogue. Don't point fingers and just explain how this affects people, how it affects people's psyche and how we could do better. I think we could definitely do better. So yeah, for me, when people say they're colorblind, I think that's a, that's a like, a, oh, okay, now what do we do about it? How do we have a discussion? What does that really mean? Um, but I think it really starts with the dialogue. And the last thing I'll say in all this is, this world has become extremely divisive. Again, like I said earlier, we can't live, we live in this binary world, you're either on or off. And I don't think that needs to be the way. I think we just need to have a discussion about what it is and how it could be better. Because I think as a nation, we could be better. This is not the best of us. Um, Juneteenth for me, I, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm going into a tangent, but I gotta go on this one. I did not know what Juneteenth was until 10 years ago. I am a person of color. I did not know what Juneteenth was. Now everyone knows what Juneteenth is. Um, but I did not know what it was 10 years ago. And the reason I didn't know is a couple of reasons. One, as Haitian American, Juneteenth didn't have the same relevance to me because in 1804, we beat Napoleon. But the second thing is Juneteenth is, you know, June 19th, 18, 1865, we were told that we're freed. But if you really look at history, it took another 100 years to get voting rights, right? Um, and to this day, we still have some challenges. So I struggled, what are we really celebrating? Are we celebrating, I'm just being an honest, raw, Ron statement. What are we celebrating? We're celebrating that we were freed. What does that really mean? Um, so while I'm happy that we have a day to celebrate something, I don't think we're, we're ready to really celebrate what it really was intended to be, and that's really freedom. So again, within the black community, there's so much diversity of thought, and that's kind of where I stand on things like Juneteenth. Makes sense, but it, at the same time, it really hasn't followed through what the intent was. Um, we're 150 years since, and we're still having this conversation, which is insane. So I'll leave it at that. So I'll, sorry, Eric, it took the mic a little longer, but go for it, Eric. Ron, thank you for taking the mic. <laughs> I think what I could add is, is two perspectives uh, here. Uh, this is interweaving kind of my personal philosophy, but more broadly, how Slalom's thinking about this. Um, two things, one, it's not enough to just say this needs to stop. We need to become anti-racist as society and corporate entities and slum is unequivocally and choosing to take a stance as an anti-racist organization and there's training uh, and awareness that comes with that and it needs to go past just all lives matter and we're going to get through this together and it needs to actually step into the space of actually understanding how different the experience can be 
you know, as a hetero white male, I don't experience racism on a regular basis. And it's very hard for me to even step into the shoes of my friends and colleagues. And I think part of the journey we're on is for white America to experience a little bit more what it feels like to be separate but equal in America and for our corporate cultures to start embracing the steps it's gonna take for our, our own black uh, citizens and our employees to feel safe at work and safe broadly. That's the first statement I'll make. I think the second point is uh, specifically with the tools that I shared today, one of the things we didn't get into uh, uh, in too much detail, but we have entire dashboards that allow the officers uh, to analyze that data by race very specifically, very granularly, and understand the differences. And we know from the research conducted by Stanford, if you are a white resident of Oakland and you are stopped by the police, the chances you will end up in handcuffs and then released with no citation are one in 15. If you're black, they're one in four. And that is just because of race. The data is unequivocally clear. Stanford published this, it's available on the web. And we know this is not an Oakland problem. This is a policing challenge. And this occurs across the country. And we can see in the data that blacks and whites are stopped at the same level at night. But as soon as the sun rises, blacks are stopped more often. And so one of the challenges we have as we start looking at data is to understand where some of those biases stand and then build tools that help give commanders and people that are on the right side of change the ability to see it and then act on it. Awesome. Thanks, Eric and Ron. Uh, to add to that and to add what to what Ron was saying is having the conversations, bringing the awareness, right? That's part of the point of all of this today. Obviously, also share what's going on in the tech community, but really bring awareness and have the conversations and and give it, let it be food for thought on what you can do and, um, you know, the conversations you can have and maybe the people you can influence and then your company as well. Uh, so then leaving it at that, anyone else have something interesting to share at their company of any changes uh, that have transpired from this or conversations that um, you'd like to share? Uh, Hi, the, oh, go ahead, Kevin. Oh, thanks, Jim. So uh, this is Kevin. Hey, Kevin. And, hey Piper, how are you? How are you? So, I, you. <laughs> so I have a question uh, for Ron. And Ron, we might have to take this offline for a, a longer discussion. And it, it probably really only affects me on the call. My question for, for you is, first of all, I'm very uh, impressed in your ability to really be able to share your thoughts and experiences personally with the group here. Uh, my question is around, you know, the majority of my career, almost all of my career, except for when I was younger, I think in my 20s, I was pretty verbose about a lot of things. But in most of my career, uh, you know, I've, I've, I've spent my career specifically not discussing race in the workplace. Um, and I avoided it like I avoided politics and I avoided religion in the, in the workplace. And for the most part, whenever I experienced or came across racism, I would just kind of brush it off and walk past it like it didn't exist. But now I find myself in a time when uh, I'm being asked to discuss it. Uh, and I find myself in conversations where I can't avoid discussing it. Um, my question for you is, um, how have you uh, found uh, the comfort uh, and the ability to be able to speak so openly about race? That's a, uh, Kevin, that's a great question. And I, for some reason, I feel like I've met you before. Um, uh, you have. <laughs> <laughs> Black folks. Yeah. <laughs> All right, cool. You have dreads, right? Yeah, I do. Yeah, it'll pull right, back. Right, yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, so for me, it's for me, it was, um, how do I put this? It was a, a challenge. And I think my sister, who I mentioned earlier to you, um, is a psychologist. And so she's my free help, right? <laughs> and so for years, I'll, I'll give you a quick backstory as to how I was able to get more comfortable with it. So for a year and a half, I was in the foster system. Um, I was my whole freshman year in high school and half of sophomore year, I, um, the, I was a ward of the state due to some challenges that we had. And I saw some things, I avoided things. 
And so I always noticed that. And then a year later, when I was going to a Bulls rally, because the Bulls just beat your Lakers, if you guys are Laker fans. <laughs> um, and I was headed downtown to Grant Park. Well, and, uh, you still got 15. You only got six, man. We're working on it. <laughs> Um, but I was headed to a Bulls rally, and unfortunately, I was a victim of a gunshot, and then my cousin died in my arms. And um, I remember that always stuck with me, and I remember I was arrested. Um, I woke up in, a, in an ambulance handcuffed, even though I was a victim. And so I talked to my sister about it over the years. I never talked about it. And then I was doing a youth program in Long Beach when I lived out there in L.A. And I just wanted to somehow kind of talk to the kids about something, and my sister said, use your story as something to learn from, as a learning experience, right? Because sometimes they just don't know. And I always come to the assumption that everyone has the best intent, but they're just not aware. So I started sharing my story and just say, hey, this is not to make anyone feel bad or feel guilty for me because you know everyone has their own story, but this is just a story about how I've experienced it. And I do it in a way that's not combative, if you've noticed that. It is what it is, we don't like it, we need to improve it, but for me, I'm comfortable bringing it up. I used to never touch politics. I am now working for Governor Pritzker, who has publicly have made statements against other people. So I'm in, I'm in the game now. I, I can't avoid that part. But when it comes to race, I always come from the point of view that people just are not aware. They just don't know. And when I learned also, last thing on this, is that in Southern California, it's, it's a very diverse area. I mean, it's extremely diverse. There's things that in California you just take for granted and then you do a stint in the middle of America, and you're like, wow, um, it's just a different world. And you've seen it, Kevin, in your travels, right? Mm -hmm. um, so for me, it's like, I'm just comfortable talking about it, but I do it in a way that's not combative. It's just a matter of fact. Here's a story. Um, put yourself in my shoes. How would you feel? And the answer is usually pretty bad. And so the question is, how could you help me never make this happen for someone after me? But I think Kevin um, and, and Davida and all the other people have called on the phone, and Davida, you do this as well. You just got to be engaging and just kind of tell your story, because if you don't tell it, someone else will tell it for you. I'm sorry that's a, that's a rip from Hamilton, but it's true. If you don't tell your own story, someone will. So why don't you tell your story the way you know it and the way you lived it? So that's kind of how I kind of come across, and that's why it helps me. But it took my sister to one day just throw cold water on me and say, hey, that was something traumatic. You got through it use that as a tool to help other people get through it as well. And ever since then, I've been very comfortable with it. But to this day, when I go to conferences, I am still at Wallflower a little bit. Um, unless I see someone like a happy face, like a, a Jim or someone else or a Doug, then I kind of gravitate to it. But to this day, I'm still a little apprehensive because, you know, that really sucks. I don't want to be, my credentials be checked every five minutes when I have a huge badge on my chest as guest speaker. I mean, let's get past that. And I don't know where the coffee is. I prefer tea, so let's go with that. So uh, <laughs> those are my thoughts. But Kevin, let's keep up. And I'm sorry, there's some questions on here. For some reason, my chat's not responding. So um, please just send me a LinkedIn or a message, and I'll, I'll get back to you if you sent me a message. I apologize. Cool. Thanks. No problem. Great. And to add to that, um, I feel that everyone has a story. You know, I've talked to my family members, friends, clients, colleagues, and I didn't know, I wasn't aware that every single black person I know in my life has a story. So I think sharing those stories, like Ron said, helps bring the awareness of what a serious systemic problem this is. Um, so thank you for all of you for sharing, you know, the hard, uncomfortable traumas. And thank you, Kevin, for asking. Okay, so we have one other um, comment. Uh, Karen, do you, do you want to speak on your comment or should I read it? What's your preference? Um, no, I don't mind speaking on it. I think, um, you know, I've, I've been trying to just get up to speed. I'm a middle-aged white woman named Karen from the Midwest. So I've got a lot, you know, a, a lot to learn. And George Floyd obviously was the tipping point for a lot of people. And certainly for me made me realize I never, ever, ever want to stop learning and stop paying attention ever again. So I found White People for Black Lives. And um, it's been, it's, it's white people educating 
other white people on how to be anti-racist so as not to put a burden, a further burden on um, the black community and other people of color. But it's also an ally organization with um, Black Lives Matter. So there's an action branch as well that you can get very involved in the community. And if you're not in the LA area, um, Surge, which I also posted there, you can just Google it. Um, it's in cities all over the nation, so you can get involved. There's lots of ways to get involved. There's excellent resources, books, et cetera. So, you know, I guess for me, it, it was a call, of, call to action to step up and learn and, and then start doing something about it. Amazing. Thanks for sharing that. Thank you, Karen. And, and sorry, and one last thing I'll say, though, is if it weren't for technology, because we're a technology group, we would not know about George Floyd. We would not know about Ahmaud Arbery. We would not know about many of these people that have passed. Trayvon Martin. Breonna Taylor. Yeah, yeah Bri um, Trayvon Martin did not have a camera when he was coming home with Skittles and a hoodie. So we don't know the true story and Mr. Zimmerman got freed or whatever. So technology, what we do uh, is opening up the eyes, it's exposing things and the work that Eric's doing, the data is gonna be extremely important. The one thing I'll say to Eric, and you'll understand this, is that we black folks are a little suspect of data. Uh, data has been manipulated in ways that have not helped us. Um, so the better you could get advocates um, in the black community to understand it and be your advocate will go such a long way. Um, because we can take you back to Tuskegee Eric, um, syphilis experiments. There's still an era of caution when it comes to data. But the more you do that, bring on advocates to speak, um, the more people will just embrace the data as truth. Ron, thanks for highlighting that. And I just want to, uh, to add to that. We have, we are really absolutely clear that Rose lenses are not a part of the conversation. And we're making sure when we work with departments going forward that we don't try to build tools that help them wallpaper over a systemic issue with an acknowledgement that we understand that America has a long way to go to become equitable and, and whether policing is even the right answer. One thing we're working on for phase three with Oakland is actually a deep analysis of the call data. They code their data, uh, the calls, in 243 different types. And one of the questions we're helping them answer is, fundamentally, do we need to send someone with a gun to answer a nonviolent request? And that's part of the conversation going forward is, right now, if you pick up 911, you get a fireman, a paramedic, or somebody with a gun. And maybe that's not the right answer going forward for a majority of our community needs. And hopefully through analytics and really understanding that data, we're gonna have fundamental conversations around what is the right response to take care of our residents. Correct, and I think that's spot on. And defunding, I know there's a lot of spin on the word defund. I, I personally think it's the wrong word. Um, I think you just gotta revisit the funding model and do what you're saying. You know, send out someone like my sister who used to do this in New York. When there is a chronic issue and it's a mental health issue, for example, an officer going in um, unfortunately, you might have the wrong temperament and walks into a situation. By the way, I have two cousins, first cousins, who are Chicago PD. Um, and you know, it's, I, I get their perspective. And they are put into very uncomfortable situations um, where it's a life or death situation. So um, the better we could do it, the better we could do with analytics. Um, and again, defund is, in my opinion, not the right word. I think we just got to revisit the funding models and where is the money being spent. Uh, that's my opinion on the whole defund the statement. But of course, that's getting spun into a whole, we don't want police. I need police, I want police. <laughs> it's very important. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we need it. So um, we just need the right level of public safety. Let's call it that. Thank you. Awesome. So we are getting close to time or we're at time. There was one more great question if you guys are comfortable with um, uh, having one more person open it up and kind of share a comment. Any objections? Great. All right. So, Emmanuel from Live Nation, um, do you want to go ahead and speak on this or should I read it for you? Oh, oh I, I can go ahead and speak. No, I appreciate it. All right. Wonderful. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Um, no, this has been phenomenal. I uh, actually joined a little bit late, but uh, came in at a good time, I think. And um, I'm actually a data professional, data architect. I use some of the tools that um, Eric from Slalom spoke about. And so I got pretty excited just as a data professional, um, seeing that kind of uh, technology applied to 
uh, such a set of complex and critical issues right now. So first of all, I just yeah, wanted to say again, kudos to Slalom and I look, I look forward to seeing how, um, how that turns out for Oakland. Um, I did have a question. I, I get into conversations with friends and family and, and colleagues about, um, you know, I, I think a couple people on the call have talked about trusting data. And uh, so I had asked, and Eric did actually post um, a link um, at a, uh, what is it, oagcalifornia.gov, um, and more specifically, but I was just looking for resources uh, that were with viable data that I can inform myself and, um, and then be an informed uh, participant in conversations uh, so that I, I'm speaking from a, a base of knowledge and not just uh, either emotions or, or anecdotes. So I was just looking for other, other wow. sources, that, uh, viable sources that people trust in this area. Wonderful. Wonderful. Also, Emmanuel, do you mind sharing, um, putting you on the spot a little bit, sorry, about what you do with Live Nation um, as far as diversity? Oh, sure. Um, so, yeah, in addition to my, uh, my paid position, uh, I spent three years as the co-lead of uh, B at Live Nation, which is the Black employee group here at Live Nation. Um, we Live Nation Entertainment um, includes both the Ticketmaster division and uh, and a Live Nation Concerts division, so it's um, pretty widespread. And um, we've taken it upon ourselves to do um, to support uh, the segments of our of our uh, employees as um, with ERGs, employee resource groups, and um, we have different chapters in different locations. Um, and uh, I had the pleasure of serving here for three years at, for B at Live Nation uh, in Los Angeles. Awesome, thank you. And one more quick thing, that does, uh, that includes inclusion, correct? Inclusion is one of your big um, stances? Yeah, and in fact, we, we, we've moved on from calling it inclusion to belonging. So uh, it's cool. different. Yeah, so now we refer to it as diversity and belonging, more than just including people. We want uh, people to feel that sense that they are supposed to be here and that they have every reason and right to be here. So that's right. Right, Bernard. Awesome. Yes. Um, we could send out, there's some research that's been done at UCLA um, from a professor here who studies race and organizational behavior. Um, he's provided a couple of articles to me for actually other reasons, but I can, we can send that off to the, um, to the participants as well once, um, once they complete the call. That would be ex that would wonderful. Be great. Thank you so much. I think what I'd awesome. also uh, add in really quickly is I'm going to post links right now. Uh, this is an evaluative framework for the responsible use of technology in policing, as well as legislation the Stanford reports, and then California's advisory board. If you want to go deeper on this, I've been in the space for a couple of years really trying to understand uh, who is doing great work to support this. And I have to say that NYU Policing Project is a very progressive and thoughtful organization inside NYU's law school that's helping provide some of the strategies and frameworks for engaging in the technology space around policing. And then more broadly, California's work uh, with the state's uh, race and identity profiling advisory board uh, is really speaking to some of the deepest challenges in our society and trying to use both normative frameworks as well as uh, analytics uh, to drive those conversations going forward. Great. Okay. Thank you. You got awesome. it. Awesome. Thank you, Thanks, Amanda. Sarah. Great. So does anyone else, I know we're over, and if you need to jump off, we need to end, we can do that. Um, if people want to keep talking, we can do that as well, I think. So if there's any other comments, questions? actions you're taking at your company's inspiration from this event? Well, this, I, no? this is Jim Rinaldi. I'd like to say a couple yeah. of words is one that uh, this, is, this is a conversation that I, I think needs to continue to happen. But also, I, this is the first Agreed. one in all the thousand Zoom meetings I've been in where we've had this type of conversation. And I think, uh, you know, uh, kudos to Piper and 
and Ron and Eric for pulling all this together and Rafi uh, and, and Don, uh, because this is the kind of thing that this community can really at least listen here and hopefully take uh, something back. Uh, the thing I would like to see is leaders lead and set examples because that means a lot to people uh, looking up if they're looking up to their leadership or the CIO or the executives or whatever, you know, you are influenced by who you're with. And, and uh, so be responsible and, uh, you know, carry yourself the right way, be fair. All those kind of things are, are qualities that we want out of our leaders. And so I think I take out of this is, is you can't walk in the other person's sh sh uh, shoes, but you certainly should be able to, to uh, see what they go through to the best you can and try to be true to yourself as well as true to your team. And um, just uh, recommend we take that out of this. And Piper, one thing too is that, um, and I asked Rafi this, but if uh, when this is out and can it's recorded and after it's yes. uh, put together, if there could be some links sent out so people can know how to get to it, that would be excellent. Yes, absolutely. That was going to be part of my closing. Um, so thank you. Uh, this is a recorded session. So I know a lot of people had an interest. Um, this is a conversation that unfortunately, you know, as Jim, you highlighted, a lot of people haven't had. And we hope this inspires other people to have the conversation um, and bring the awareness to how important this topic is. So we will provide uh, the link once it's edited and, you know, put together uh, a nice edited version. So is there anything else um, anyone else would like to add? No? Okay. I, so I just wanna, oh. No, I'll yeah. just say thank you. Just, just thank you. Please keep it going. It's exhausting. Awesome, thanks. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. And I think the other part of this is we want to make this not just a moment, but a movement. And in order to make this a movement, you know, we have to keep having the conversations and bringing awareness. And, and it's interesting, as Ron highlighted, um, the huge role in the tech community. I mean, it's true. We wouldn't have seen that poor man die and have this uproar if it wasn't for technology. So we're in a day and age that um, tech can have a huge role in a huge social change. So first off, I just want to say thank, I want to thank everyone. Um, I hope, you know, some or all of you were inspired to take action or make deeper connections um, with one another and to create a better future for all of us. Be the change you want to see in the world is what Gandhi said. And I think that's a beautiful quote to sum this up. Um, finally, as you see on the screen, there's some upcoming virtual events. We do host series of these. As you know, this was one in the series. Uh, the next one is July 16th and so forth. Rocky, if you want to highlight anything on those or Davida, please feel free. No, you'll find the information for all, uh, for all these events on our website uh, under events. So if you'd like to register, <coughs> The July 16th is, uh, is open for registration as well as the August 6th, the social happy hour. Uh, that'll be our second uh, happy hour for the year. So if you'd like to register, we highly recommend that you attend. And then we'll also planning on the August 27th automation uh, uh, topic and September 17th virtual education and another uh, happy, uh, third happy hour on October 8th. And our uh, final event of the year is on November 12th, the Executive Leadership Awards uh, event. And the keynote speaker is Guy Kawasaki. So we are in the planning stages of that and we'll open the registration up for that uh, in very, very soon. Hey, and Robbie, yeah, just to Great. add, for all the CIOs that are still still on the call, we're, we're doing uh, another CIO exchange on July 30th. Yes, and you'll receive an email this week. Uh, awesome, and then one other thing, for some of the guests that joined this call today who maybe aren't members, and enjoyed um, the event or have curiosity about doing more, please reach out to Rafi, uh, actually, I'm sorry, Doug, not Rafi, but I guess you could reach out to Rafi as well. 
and um, direct any questions towards him. Uh, and then finally, there will be, I believe, a survey after this, correct, Rafi? Yes, yes, and, and uh, with Eric's permission, we'll have the slides uh, included as part of the survey, as once you complete the survey, you'll have access to the slides. Eric, I assume I, Perfect. It, it, uh, it's, it's okay to share those slides? Yeah, we, we'd love for this solution to get out there. Great, thank you. Wonderful. And then as far as providing the content, um, how will they notate it in the survey or will that be? You mean the recording or? The recording, yeah. Yeah, the recording, what we'll do is we'll edit the recording. We don't, we don't send out the raw version of the recording. We'll edit it professionally. Right. We'll, we'll post those on, on our YouTube channel. If you're not uh, subscribed to it, we highly recommend that you subscribe to it. And we'll also post it on our new website, which is going to launch next month. Perfect. Wonderful. And then if there's any, for, I know a lot of people had questions from different cities about bringing the solutions. Um, I think Eric has his email up there. You can uh, reach out to him with any questions. Um, and I think that's, that's it. Thanks so much, Piper. Thanks. Thank you, everyone. Thanks, Piper. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Thanks, Eric. Thanks. Thanks all. Thanks. So good. So good. Thank Thanks you. All. Great job, everyone. Thank you. Have a good one.